BrethrenNews.com presence. Please, uh, tr I trust you're all ready for the, uh, the Word of God. Please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll read a few verses there. The passage that we've been considering over the last couple of days. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, please. <clears throat> We read there, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ." from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. We will refer to other passages as well, but we will stop the reading there for now. And the Lord will bless the reading of his precious word. We've been looking at uh, this great and wonderful theme of equipping the saints for building up the body. And we've already been looking at a couple of uh, topics concerning this over the last couple of days, starting with Christ, who is the source of the growth, and then equipping uh, the saints for the work of the ministry. And today what we want to look at is equipping the saints for, uh, to grow in maturity. And we see that in the scriptures, there is a tremendous concern that God has with maturity. And he talks about how a Christian is to mature in Christ and unto Christ's likeness. This passage that we've been reading together and considering over the last two days and also for the next couple of days, uh, concerns the w a work that God has started in being able to bring a people unto himself in saving them and bringing them together in a universal church and then also in local gatherings and then giving them gifts and gifted men so that the body, each individual as well as the collective unity will be built up in Christ. And in order for this to function, God has provided certain means for the assembly and for the church. So we will look at this today in terms of how is it that a person matures? How is it that the body of Christ is built up and, and on to maturity? So we will take a look at that today. Now we were considering and uh, talking about the equipping of the saints. And when we talk about the equippers who equip the saints, we see that, that an equipped saint is a saint who is maturing. Because an equipped saint is one who is able to handle the word of God, one who is able to teach others, and one who is able to uh, continue to mature and to know God. So we will take a look at this in just a few minutes. Now, I just want to mention that there are two components in maturity. Number one, there is a corporate component, and that is what we read about here. And there is also an individual component in maturity. And that is also just as important as the corporate component. If a person, a Christian, goes to church, he sits under sound word, but then when he goes home, he puts the Bible on the shelf and does not look at it for a whole week. And then next Sunday, when he's ready to go to meeting, he pulls the Bible out, dusts it off, runs to meeting. There is no chance for that person to grow in maturity. 
There is a need for that person that when he gets home or she gets home, that she opens the scriptures and studies, meditates upon what is learned. So there is a corporate component where we fellowship together, we learn from the word of God. There is a, an individual component where we at home as well learn and grow in the scriptures. So we're going to take a look at this and try to understand what it means to, to grow in maturity. I want to divide this into four topics. Number one, I want to talk about the explanation of maturity. Number two, I want to talk about the expectation of maturity. Number three, the effecting of maturity. How do we bring about maturity in a Christian's life? And number four, what is the evidence? the evidence of maturity. So we want to talk about these four topics uh, as part of this message as allowed by time. So number one, the explanation of perfection. What does it mean to be mature? You know, if you and I see someone who uh, is physically mature, we would recognize that, wouldn't we? If we see somebody who's immature physically, we would recognize that as well. And we are all capable, I think at least most of us are, capable of recognizing physical maturity. You know, for Priya and I, we learned this lesson about eight years ago, and it was a very tough time because we were expecting our child who was to be born, and the doctors gave us the, the terrible news that he had not grown in the womb. He was much smaller than what he should have been at that age. It was pretty close to being born. Needless to say, it was a horrible time for us. It was terrible. We were asking the question, why didn't he grow? Did, did she and I, Priya and I, do something wrong that would cause him not to grow in the womb? There was a lot of self-reflection about what did we do over the previous eight months. So we thought about this and considered it. But at the end, we had to say that this was the will of God because there was nothing within our control that we could have controlled to do anything differently. It was within the will of God. And so we spent many hours in prayer and the saints in our assembly did as well. The saints in a number of other assemblies prayed for us also. And I wanna say God answered our prayers. He heard it and he answered our prayers. And today my son is probably the healthiest in our whole family. You know, there is, when our children are not maturing, the parents are concerned, aren't we? We look at them, whether they physically are growing, whether they spiritually are growing, whether they emotionally are growing, and we look at all of these things to see how our children are doing. And so we are able to look at others and recognize, to, the, to some extent, physical maturity. But how about spiritual maturity? Can we look at someone else and see how they're doing spiritually? But even before that, can we look at the mirror and see where I am on the maturity ladder? How am I doing spiritually? Am I growing in maturity or not? Am I a, am I a young child? Am I a, a little child? Am I a young man? Or am I a father? Am I able to determine my own spiritual uh, maturity? You know, the Bible tells us that a mature Christian is one who attained to Christ-likeness. But what does it mean to be Christ-like? What does that mean? In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul said, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Romans 13 and verse 14 reads, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now when we read that, we sometimes would think that it is like putting on clothing, that we are actually putting on something. But the word put on is actually much more than that than just putting on clothing. The meaning is, is uh, to become like him in all aspects, in the very core of our being, our fiber, that we become like him, that we imitate Christ, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, is what the scripture says. 
Philippians chapter 2, we read of Christ's humility, and it starts by, the, uh, by saying this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, so to be Christ-like means to embody and exude the communicable character of the Lord Jesus Christ within our core and in our outward projection as well. What we are internally is what we project outward. And others should be able to see when they look at us, our character, our words, the way we act, the way we relate to others, that, they, that we are Christ-like in character. And we do that with our children. When we look at our children, we naturally, when they're born, scan their faces, we look at their faces to see who they are like. And then as they grow, we, we determine how their character is. Is it like dad? Is it like mom? Is it like the grandparents? And so we are naturally curious about that. And God as well is seeking, searching our hearts. He's searching to see, are we Christ-like? Are we becoming more and more and more like his son? every single day that is God's requirement for you and I now before we get to the next point let me just mention a couple of misconceptions uh, about uh, maturity number one maturity is not linked to how old we are physically uh, and this is, uh, this is uh, you know, might be shocking to some people, but we might see a gray-haired uh, older Uppachan and think that he is very mature, but that may not be the case at all. Physical maturity is not linked to sp uh, spiritual maturity. There could be younger people here who are perhaps more mature than certain older people that, he than, that are here as well. Number two, Secular position and knowledge is not a measure of spiritual maturity. You know, it is very natural for us to be able to look at someone who is very accomplished secularly, that they have a good position in a, uh, uh, a good position in a company, they have a good position in a bank, they have a good position somewhere else, and they are really accomplished and they do really well. And then when it comes to the church, we look at that and say, why don't you take this high position? Or why don't you do this ministry? Or why don't you do that? The problem is, secular uh, accomplishments does not equate to spiritual maturity. You know, Acts chapter 4 and verse 13 shows us that the Lord Jesus Christ used uneducated, ignorant fishermen to proclaim his word. Number three, biblical knowledge is not necessarily a measure of spiritual maturity. And what do I mean by this? You know, there may be people who are very good at memorizing scriptures. There are very, people who are very good at looking at some of, some of the things in the Word of God. And, and that may be true. But that does not mean that they are spiritually mature. That in their spiritual character that they are more Christ-like. You know, we know that even, uh, I know even atheists who are able to quote the scripture better than many Christians that I know. And it does not mean that they are more Christ-like. Number four, spiritual maturity is not uh, just for a few select people. It is not just for the elders. It is not just for the, uh, the, the, uh, the equippers. It is not just for men. It is for every single believer that is in the fellowship of the local assembly. It is for every single person to mature spir spiritually. God commands everyone to mature. So let me move on to my next point, which is the expectation of maturity. The expectation of maturity. You know, I've read uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. We know that verse, right? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father uh, in heaven is perfect. And I used to read that verse and wonder to myself, wow, this is a, a great great high um, uh, target that God has set. It is a tremendously high goal for us to be able to, to try to attain to perfection. Be ye perfect. And then the measure of the perfection is 
the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I used to wonder, how could this be? Because as a young person, I was sin sinning left and right. Even if I did not want to, I was doing things that I should not have done. And I used to wonder, how could it be that we all be perfect? You know, when you look at this word perfect that is in Matthew chapter 5, it is the same word that is used here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. A perfect man. And we read that that word, or the, the meaning of that word, is completeness, full grown. It means to mature as an adult. It does not mean sinless perfection. You know, this standard that God has set to be perfect is not anything new. He has set this standard in the Old Testament as well for the faithful. You remember the words in Leviticus chapter 19, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, is holy. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 13, God commands, Thou shalt be perfect before the Lord thy God. You know, even in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, we read, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this command to be perfect, this command to be mature, is nothing new. God has demanded this of his people throughout the ages. And we are no different. Now I would naturally ask myself this question, well, is it possible for us to be perfect while here upon this world? And there's a few verses that I can point out, but let me just re uh, refer to two. First John chapter 1 and verse 8, we know this word which, which, uh, which reads, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You know, as long as the flesh is in us, there will be sin somewhere. But our purpose, our plan should be to, to beat that down and to continue to grow in maturity. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12 to 16, Paul tells us a little bit about his own maturity. He analyzes his own maturity. And in verse 12, we read this, Not that I have already obtained to this, or I am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. You know, and when Paul wrote this, he's, uh, he's been a Christian for about 25 years. He's taken about three missionary trips, and he's written about nine epistles. But yet he still says, I have not made it my own. So I believe the answer is that we cannot be sinlessly perfect. But we are expected to continue on to perfection, to that Christ-like character. And to be able to, to continue that process of growth every day of our lives. Now we've been talking about uh, perfection in the, uh, the perfect man. That it is the result, the result of uh, the equipping of the saints. And so uh, John actually evaluates the people that he is writing to. And he gives them a scale. So turn with me to 1 John chapter, one, uh, chapter 2 please. We'll read those verses for a second. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 12. <clears throat> we read there, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. You know, John takes the people that he's writing to, and he divides them into a number of stages. Stages of maturity. Take a look at this for a second. 
And, and let's take a look at these three categories or stages that he puts them in. The first one is little children. You know, John writes to this, this uh, letter that he writes, he calls the people that he's writing to little children. It is, it is a term of affection. It is a term that he uses for all Christians, whether younger or older. But this word that we find here in verse 12 is a different word. It is a word that means someone who is small, someone who is young, someone who is not mature. And we read about this little children. It says, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. These little ones are saved. They have known the Lord Jesus Christ. They have become children of God. But there is not much more than that. And as a result, they, we read there that, uh, that they, are, uh, they can be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So a little child needs to mature. If they remain as little children with no growth in them, then it is very easy for the devil to come and derail that person, take him to this place or that place, take him away from the word. These are the people that need to grow and to continue on to maturity. And John writes here that they should abide in him. How many of us fall into this category? Little children. They have salvation, but not much more. The next stage that we read here is regarding young men. And when we talk about young men, we associate youth and vigor and energy. You know, and these are Christians that have grown and they're no longer children. They have learned the doctrines. They have learned from the word of God. And they are able to, to withstand the devil because they know the word of God. They no longer need milk, but they take meat. They study the word. They understand it. They are able to, to digest it, to divide it, and to proclaim it. There is a tremendous growth from little children to the young men that is described here, isn't there? Young men. They know the word. But not only do they know the word, they have been tested. Their faith has been tested, and they have overcome the evil one. How many of us fall into this category of young men? Thirdly, we read about fathers. Fathers. The name itself indicates a high level of maturity, doesn't it? And John states twice about the fathers, you have known him who is from the beginning. So fathers are the ones who continued on in their maturity. They have taken it to the next level where they are occupied by the, uh, with the glory of God. They're considering the one who is from eternity to eternity. Their occupation, their delight, their joy is in the very character of God himself. They have known him who is from the beginning. The apostle John himself is a great example, isn't he? John 1.1, 1, 1. if we take a, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1, if we take a look at that verse and we study it, we read the great depth of uh, knowledge, the great depth of love that John has for his savior. It's amazing to be able to consider it. Would we be ever able to say that, such things? Take a look at that verse and study that for yourselves. Which of these stages do you and I fit into? Consider that for a second. But let it, regardless of which stage we're in, what God expects of you and I is that we continue on to maturity. Let's move on to the next point. The effecting of perfection. The effecting of perfection. How do we attain to spiritual maturity? Now I've already said that there's two components here. 
There is the component that we read about in Ephesians, uh, the assembly context, where uh, the, the church context, the body context, where we, uh, where we have equippers, uh, those who we read about in verse 11 that our uh, brother was talking to us about yesterday. Their purpose is to be able to proclaim the word to us, to teach us from the word of God, to help us, to equip us, to help us to do the work of the ministry, to serve in the assembly, to serve the people of God, and we all grow in Christ. So there is the, the, uh, uh, the corporate component. There is also the individual component, where there is a need for us to spend quiet time with the Lord. There is a need for us to look into the Word of God and pull out the truths that are contained there. There is a need for us to be able to look at uh, or spend time in prayer with God and to be able to consider who He is and to appreciate who He is. So there is a need for both components. But whenever we read about God's command, when God has commanded us to do something, there's no doubt that God gives us the ability, the means to be able to do that as well. If God expects us to grow in Christ, there, is, there are things that he has provided to us to be able to grow. You know, there's four things that uh, let me just quickly mention. Number one, he has given us the Spirit of God. Each one of us, when we were born into Christ, the Spirit indwelt us. And so this Spirit lives in us continually. And sometimes we forget that the Spirit is in us. And what God demands of us is that we yield to the Spirit. The more that we yield to the work of the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit, what will happen is that the Spirit will enable our growth. He will help us to mature. He will mature us. You know, the physical growth, physical growth is not something we do, is it? You know, we don't go to bed one night and say, tonight I'm going to grow physically three inches. That just doesn't happen. But we do certain things to help. We take in food, we drink, we get plenty of rest, we study to, to help our uh, brain grow. We do all of these things but the growth is instilled in us, into our genes. The Spirit of God is the one that, that grows us. Without Him, there would be no growth. But there is a need for us to do certain things in order to grow. And number, the first thing is that we need to yield to the Spirit. Number two, He has given us the Word of God. You know, God has written down all of these words, every single word from the mouth of God. And it boggles my mind that the God of heaven would reveal himself in the pages of scripture for people such as us. But he has done that so that we can read it and we can know him. There's no other way that we can know him, is there? We need to learn from the word of God. We need to read it and study it. He has given us the gifts of the Spirit. Now, we've mentioned this briefly, and there's a workshop, so I'm not going to take too much time on the gifts of the Spirit. But the assembly has been given certain gifts by the Spirit. And these gifts are for the purpose of helping the saints to minister to one another. It is to help the assembly, the body of Christ, to grow. It is to help each and every individual to minister to the others. And we must use them. The problem is that we have these gifts that God has given us, and we do have them, because the Bible tells us every single person who is born into Christ has been given a gift, at least one. The problem is that many times we don't use it. We sit on it. We have this great, great tool that God has given to us, and we leave it in the box, and we never take it out. We need to pull it out on a daily basis and use it with the saints in our assembly. When we fellowship together, when we come together, and whatever, whatever would be helpful that God has given to us as our gift, let us make sure that we exercise it when we are with the Christians. Fourthly, he has given us the people of God. 
uh, a Christian cannot grow by himself. And I know a couple of them who are genuinely saved, but unfortunately, for some reason that I can't seem to understand, has no desire to meet with other Christians. The problem they will encounter is that they are not going to grow. They are not going to mature because they need to be in a context of fellowship. They need to exercise that fellowship. They need to exercise the gifts that God has given to them. If they don't do that, they will not grow. He has given us the people of God. A, f a good friend of mine used to love to say, and I think this is probably uh, some, something that everyone says, uh, a single piece of wood would quickly die fire on a single piece of wood. Well, when you put many together and you uh, build a, a fire, when you put stack many pieces of wood together, the fire burns harder, hotter, brighter, and longer because each supports the other. So let us make sure that we as Christians, we fellowship together, we come together, and we help one another out, we encourage one another out, we, uh, we uh, exhort one another to grow in Christ. Uh, secondly, I want to say that that spiritual maturity cannot be obtained without striving. Uh, there is something that we must do. It is a verb that we must exercise in order for it to build us up. Just like in our physical building up of exercise, some people build muscles. There is work that is required to be able to accomplish that. And here as well, spiritual maturity cannot be obtained without maturing. We can't focus on other things and leave the things of Christ to be the last priority. We give priority to, the, to our work. We give priority to our friends. We give priority to sports. We give priority to all of these things. But when it comes to our own maturity, that's the last thing we think about. And we may not even think about it. If we do that, we will not mature. We must make a point to make spiritual, maturing spiritually the first priority in each one of our lives. There must be a concerted plan and effort for our spiritual maturity. Where do you and I rank? Where do, I, where do you and I rank spiritual growing and maturity in all the things that we have on our list? Let us consider that and make sure that that is the first thing. Now let me mention a few things that we need to do, uh, uh, it, whether individually or corporately, to ensure that uh, we effect maturity. Number one, lay aside every weight. Lay aside every weight. You know, we cannot mature spiritually unless we first remove those things that hinder us, that pulls us down. Just like a person running to the gold, uh, a goal that there is nothing that they want them holding back from reaching that goal. Lay aside every weight and sin which death so easily beset us. Isn't that right? It's amazing when you think about it, the sin that so easily besets us. It might be something we're driving down the road and all of a sudden a thought pops into our head. And then the next hour is gone. And we've come down, isn't it? The weight that is around us. We cannot mature when sin keeps us down. There's many things in the scripture about uh, exhorting us to be able to, uh, to, uh, to get rid of the sin and to focus upon the things of God. Do we have vices in our lives, whether it be alcohol or drugs or, or whatever it is? Whether, uh, are there people that, that we have enmity with? Are there people that, that we are angry towards, that we, wouldn't, we uh, are not uh, brothers and act as brothers? There is a need for us to make sure that we mend our relationships and we grow in character with one another. 
relationships, vices, other problems, sins that so easily beset us. Let us make sure that we put these aside and that we grow. You know, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Confess our sins. Don't wait till the end of the week, but today. As soon as the sin is committed, when we realize that we have done something that hinders our spiritual progress, confess that to him immediately. And God promises that he will forgive us our sins. You know, I was studying recently the life of David uh, for, a, for an assembly study that I was doing. And as I was studying and I was writing down notes, at a point I realized and I stopped and I put the pencil down and I said to myself, you know, if this man, King David, showed up at my assembly, I would have a tremendous difficulty inviting him to my house. When you think about it, he was a man who was uh, a polygamist, he was uh, a liar, he was an adulterer, he was a uh, murderer, right? And that's just the beginning. Would we want something, somebody like that in our house? But what does God say about David? That he was a man after God's own heart. And I had trouble reconciling uh, these two things. The character that we read about him and what God says about him. And the answer is found in David's life. You know, one of the things that David would do when he realized of his sins, he made sure to confess his sins. We read in the scriptures over and over that he confessed his sins. Second Samuel 24, David says, I have sinned greatly. Psalm 119, we read, I hate every wicked way. Let us make sure that we confess our sins. Number two, set your heart to study the law of the, uh, the, law of the Lord and to do it. Uh, when Ezra came back from Persia, we read that one of the first things that he did was he took the, the law of God and he set his heart. He prepared his heart to study it, to do it, and to teach it. Three things. He set his heart. There was a, a desire on his heart. That was, a, that was what he wanted to accomplish first, to learn the law of God. How about you and I? Do we have a desire to look into the word of God and to study it? When we go to our local assembly, are we getting the food that we need? The equippers, are they providing the, the meat for the people to be able to, to consume and to grow? Words that they can ponder upon that would help them to continue grow. You know, part of the problem is that in our assemblies, that those who are less mature are the ones who are teaching the word of God. You know, I've seen chill, young people's meetings, and I was even involved in them, where a young person who barely knows the Bible is teaching other young people who knows no, no, more, no less than he does. And the problem is they're all blindly looking through the Word of God to try to find something, a little nugget, and they take that and they apply it, and it is incorrect. And as, it, as a result, it causes them to go in the wrong direction. Make sure that our study is centered upon God. Make sure that those who teach the word is able to do so. So set your heart to study the Lord, the law of the Lord, and to do it. Number three, learn from our trials. It is a fact of life that every one of us, that everyone will face trials at some point in our lives. You know, God promises that, that we will all go through trials. James chapter 1 tells us, Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
Trials that God brings into our lives leads to steadfastness, and steadfastness leads to maturity, to completeness. How great is that? The problem is when we are in the middle of the trial, we wish that it was not there. But count it all joy that we go through these trials because God has a plan and purpose of every trial that comes into our lives. You know, there's no trial that's going to come upon us without God's permission. Consider Job. Satan had to request permission from God to go and afflict him. God gave him permission. So, consider that the trials that God brings us through is for the reason of maturing us. You know, think about Hannah for a second from 1 Samuel chapter 1. You know, she had a tremendous life in, in, the, in the trials that she faced. You know, she had marriage problems. She had physical problems. She was barren. She had uh, family problems. You know, her, the other wife of uh, uh, Elkanah constantly taunted her to the point where Hannah was bitter and, uh, or uh, Hannah was so saddened that she could not eat. She could not sleep. Sleep. She was in a terrible condition. But even with all these terrible trials that Hannah was under, we read that she prayed to God faithfully. And what did God do? He, re he replied, he answered her prayer by giving her a child. He gave her a child. But that's not what I find the miraculous part. The miraculous part is found in 1 Samuel chapter 2, where we read Hannah's prayer and some of the most tremendous truths concerning God is found at the lips of Hannah. So we find that God brought her through these trials. Not only gave her a child, but he gave her an understanding of himself. He matured her. Isn't that amazing? He brings us through these trials to mature us. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, we read that. I'm not going to spend much time on it since I only have like a few minutes. So let us make sure that our prayer life is rich, that we spend time in prayer, that we bring to God the things that trouble us. 1 Corinthians, uh, next we have number five, earnestly desire the higher gifts. And we've already talked about this a little bit, and we'll talk about this more throughout this conference. We need to make sure that each one of us are exercising the gifts that God has given to us. It is not for us to save or to bury, but it is for us to use for God's purpose. And so let us make sure that we use the gifts that God has given to us. You know, it's interesting that we should also consider not using your gifts impacts others in your assembly. Think about that. If you do not use your gifts, there are others who suffer. And then lastly, continue steadfastly in fellowship. You know, one of the greatest growths that we've seen in the assembly is found in Acts chapter 2. And they continued steadfastly in fellowship. They had all things in common. They came together. They desired to come together and sit with their fellow believers and enjoy one another. Not talking about mundane things like what was happening in the Roman Empire, but to talk about what God has done for them. Well, how God has saved them. Do we have a desire to come together, to fellowship with like-minded believers, to consider God, to consider what he has done for me, to consider what he has done for you, to consider who he is, to worship him? Let us make sure that we have a desire to continue steadfastly in fellowship. This does not mean pizza and drinks, by the way. That's not what fellowship means. It means to come together to consider Christ. Now, my last point, which I have about a minute to do, is the evidence of perfection. You know, when God tells us to mature, to, to grow in maturity,
There is, there is a standard that God has set. There are certain things that we can do to look at a person's life and be able to see that that person is maturing. We're able to understand that that person is increasing. And, and uh, there are certain markers that we find in the scriptures that we can apply that I can look at myself and evaluate whether I am maturing. And let me just mention this quickly. I won't have time to explain these things. But number one, hatred of every wicked way. You know, David tells us in Psalm 119, I hate every wicked way. Are you and I able to say that? And secondly, can we say, even if I hate every wicked way, how about if we see somebody else's wicked way? A brother in Christ. Are we able to hate that wicked way as well? Are we able to correct in love and grace? I hate every wicked way. You know, uh, we, read, uh, we read, continuing on, love of the brethren. We read there in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Let us make sure that we have a tremendous love for one another. Let us make sure that we do not forsake one another. Next, evidence of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Galatians chapter 22, I'm not going to read the, word, the verse, but take a look at that. The fruit has certain characteristics that the Spirit produces in our lives. Do we find those characteristics, the very same characteristics of Christ in our lives? Evidence of the fruit. You know, Christ himself says, you shall know them by their fruit. Next, delight in the law of the Lord or the word of God. Psalm 1 tells us his delight is in the law of the Lord and in it doth he meditate day and night. Wow. Do we meditate upon the law of the Lord day and night? Do we have that same delight in the law of the Lord? Is this just another book that we put on the shelf and forget about? Let us make sure that we delight in the law of the Lord that we have a desire to meditate upon it and to continue to grow. Rejoice, next, rejoice in our sufferings. You know, it is one thing to go through suffering. It is one thing to be able to understand that there is a purpose for our suffering. But it is entirely another thing that when we are in the midst of the suffering, to be able to rejoice. Thank you, God, for the suffering that is that is going through me. Are we able to rejoice in our suffering? Let us make sure that we have, uh, that we have, a, uh, that we look at this, that we rejoice in our sufferings. Nextly, we have giving glory to God. Giving glory to God. You know, this should be the ultimate purpose of all that we do, isn't it? That in everything that we do, whether we eat, whether we drink, whatever we do, let us make sure that we give glory to God. The purpose of our growth in Christ is to glorify God. The purpose of that which we do when we exercise spiritual gifts to bring up others as well is to give glory to God. How often are we concerned and how often do we meditate upon the glory of God? You know, there's a brother in my assembly. He, he was blind when he was in the 20s. He, he became blind in the 20s. He lost his son in his 30s. And then in the, in the 70s or 80s, I met him and I knew him for about 15 years before he passed on. And I would go visit him and I'd sit in, in his tiny little apartment and next thing I know, three hours has passed. We're not talking about the weather. We're not talking about anything else. He is outpouring the glory of God. He's talking about what God has done in his life. And I look at his life and I say, I'm not blind. I haven't lost a son. I have not endured the hardships that he has. But yet he has. And he's able to proclaim 
the glory of God. He's able to bring me with him right to Christ's foot. A tremendous thing for us to be able to do. To consider the glory of God. Consider him. Bring others with us when we sit in fellowship to the very, the very foot of Christ. So with these things, let me close here since my time's already gone. We have been looking at this passage and considering maturity. And we know that Christ has given us this command to mature, that each one of us are to mature. And let us make sure that it is the highest priority for us that we consider our own maturity that we make sure that day to day, not a, not a single day goes by where we're not increasing in Christ. Let us make sure that we continue to increase and help others to increase as well. Shall we pray? Our Father, we give thanks for this opportunity to look into the Word of God and to be able to study this tremendous portion, Father, concerning the fact that, that the saints mature, the saints continue to mature through what God has done. We're thankful, Father, that God has made us his children and then demands that we mature and become Christ-like. What a great privilege for us that we who once were sinners would be able to be Christ-like. Father, we give thanks to thee for this tremendous privilege. Help each and every one of us to have a desire to be able to, to increase in our spiritual maturity. That we may have a desire to make that first priority in our lives. That every single day that we may evaluate this, Father. That we may look to Thee for help. That we may have a desire and continue to work to mature in Christ. We ask for Thy help now in the, in the remainder of the meetings this afternoon. In the precious and worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Presented by BrethrenNews.com